Hello, this is Dr. Gomez from the University of Texas Health and San Antonio, and today we're going to continue with the core exam review. This is part two. On this initial radiograph of the right hand on PA view and the magnify view of the thumb, uh, the most marked finding that we see is this clump of calcification, which is about the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. And here is a blowout view. So it's a clump of soft tissue calcification. It's cloud-like. There is no matrix production within that increased density. So it's definitely a calcification. There are other small calcifications that we could see in the soft tissues of the hand. Other than that, we don't see no erosions at the metacarpophalangeal joints or the interphalangeal joints. Uh, there is no really other soft tissue abnormality. There may be a little bit of resorption of the distal phalangeal top to the index finger, but definitely that is not too marked. Same patient lateral view of the hand, we better see the calcifications within the volar soft tissues of the fingers, and we again see the calcification about the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. There is a patient with scleroderma and they have calcification within the soft tissues due to fibrosis and pretty much ischemia, inflammation, ischemia, and fibrosis. Same patient with AP and lateral views of the forearm, we again see lots of soft tissue calcifications at the dorsal aspect of the forearm and posterior to the elbow. This calcification appear to be centered within the subcutaneous tissue and some of them may be even at the subdermal tissue. The calcifications are cloud-like and they appear like clumps. There is definitely no calcifications. These are calcifications of the soft tissues. So this is a different patient uh, with the same condition of scleroderma and we again see some soft tissue calcifications. But I want you to pay attention to the distal phalanges here at bilateral thumbs and, and the index and little fingers of the left hand. And there is chronic resorption of the distal phalangeal tuft, and that is called acrosteolysis related to soft tissue fibrosis and atrophy. And notice that there is no acute bone destruction. The borders are well defined and sclerotic, so this is a chronic process. Acrosteolysis is seen in other conditions such as uh, burns or frostbite. Um, we can also see acrosteolysis in Raynaud's disease, uh, psoriasis, uh, hyperparathyroidism. There are many conditions that you can see this phalangeal tough resorption. But if you see it in conjunction with soft tissue calcifications and very, very thin soft tissues because of the atrophy here, like we see here around um, the phalanges, then you definitely have to think of scleroderma. Remember, scleroderma is also known as progressive systemic sclerosis. It's an autoimmune disease, so you have fibrosis in a lot of parts of the body. You will also see cases in uh, the small bowel and as well as the lung. And you, in the musculoskeletal system, you will get that soft tissue atrophy and calcification. Remember the resorption of the phalangeal tuft, the acrosteolysis, and you can also have flexion contractures. So we have AP and lateral views of the elbow joint. In a patient with chronic elbow pain and swelling, we see large erosions at the proximal ulna at the region of the olecranon. On the lateral view, we also see displacement of the anterior and posterior fat pads, which tell us that there is distension of the joint, either by effusion, uh, hemarthrosis, or just synovitis. In the AP view, we can see that there is some bone resorption at the region of the peripheral capitellum and trochlea as well. So with this radiograph, we can tell that there is an articular process because there is joint distension that is causing bone destructions on both sides of the articulation. Sometimes when I present this case to residents, they usually tend to concentrate in this finding here and often start describing differential diagnosis for lesions within the bone. But you have to pay attention because in this case, there are more clues in the radiograph telling you that this is not a bone problem, but an articular problem that is extending into the bone. And the differential diagnosis will be very different from a bone process than an articular process. Also, other thing we can tell with this radiograph is that the erosion on the ulna have well-defined sclerotic borders borders, which means that the process is chronic or 
relapsing or the result of an acute process. So somebody had some type of arthropathy and it was treated and now is not active. In this case, we did an MRI and we have T1, T2, and T1 fat sat post cat images. And we see that there is distension of the joint with extensive synovitis. In the post contrast images, we see that there is enhancement of, of all the synovium within the joint. Uh, this tells us that this is an active inflammatory process. In this case, it's tuberculous arthritis, which is uh, an infectious arthropathy that behaves, uh, that is, is that progresses slow as compared to a bacterial septic arthritis that you're going to see diffuse bone destruction and no evidence of well-defined sclerotic borders of the erosions because the bone has no time to respond. You can see in the T1 and the T2, on, on the T2 that there is extensive synovitis here. All this is synovitis. So with the radiograph and MRI, we can get to a diagnosis of a chronic relapsing arthropathy but that is still active so a treated arthropathy that is not active anymore will be out of the differential diagnosis in this case the differential diagnosis would include uh, tuberculous arthritis which was this case also pvns hemophilia and amyloid arthropathy so let's discuss briefly each of this so PVNS is a metaplasia of the synovium, and you get chronic erosions because of the increased vascularity on the synovium. However, the synovium grows too fast, and it bleeds, and that bleeding leaves hemosiderin deposition within the joint. So that we will see distension of the joint, we will see erosions, but in the MRI we will see we will see susceptibility artifacts related to hemosiderin deposition. The same can be said with hemophilia because there is recurrent bleeding. We see chronic erosions and hemosiderin deposition that has been left from prior hemarthrosis. So the difference between PVNS and hemophilia is that PVNS is monoarticular. And of course, hemophilia you will see in multiple articulations because it's a systemic process. Amyloid arthropathy is also polyarticular. And in this case, it will help you to get the clinical diagnosis. I mean, and if patient has chronic kidney disease, then you should think amyloid arthropathy. And you will see amyloid within the joint, which has, which has low signal intensity in MRI, both on T1 and T2. So here we have an AP view of the knee joint, kind of a, unfortunately, low quality uh, radiograph but it served a purpose and what we see here is that there is a lucent or lytic lesion within the medial femoral condyle right here and what we can say of this lesion in the radiograph is that it's well defined seems to have a narrow zone of transition and has well defined sclerotic borders so seems to be an intermediate to low grade lesion at least with radiograph but it's lytic and the location is also important so this will be the growth plates or what it remains of it so if you can see the lesion extends on both sides of the growth plate but it's mainly on the epiphysis so we have a loosened lesion that is mainly in the epiphysis that extends into the metaphysis so we have to think about a differential diagnosis of loosened lesions within the epiphysis and the classic lesions for that will be giant cell tumor um, a chondroblastoma and also a clear cell chondrosarcoma in the adult and then the things that could happen anywhere like eg infection rhodes abscess lymphoma and so forth so in this patient we did an mri and we have t1 axial and t2 fat sat images and we again see this well defined lesion within the medial femoral condyle this low border of t1 signal intensity is the well defined sclerotic border that we see in radiograph on the t2 images we see the lesion to be well defined but we see plenty of perilational edema which is likely prominent Again, we see that this lesion is located within the epiphysis. The growth place will be somewhere around here, but some of the lesion is extending into the metaphysis. Also, if you look closely to this lesion, there is a 
fluid fluid level so there will be some type of hemorrhage or two different types of fluid composition within the lesion this uh, patient uh, has a chondroblastoma which is a typical lesion of the epiphysis usually happens in long bones such as the humerus femur and tibia it is mostly seen in the proximal humerus uh, but also we see it pretty often at the distal femur at the condyles usually happens in young patients it's a, a chondroid lesion so you may see some chondroid matrix although you don't have to see it and to differentiate from other lesions like giant cell tumor uh, the thing or the characteristic or imaging finding that helps the most is the border giant cell tumors have well-defined but non sclerotic borders and chondroblastoma has well-defined sclerotic borders because they are both lesions of the epiphysis historically we used to say that giant cell tumor will happen when the growth plate is closed and chondroblastoma would happen when the growth plate is open but i've seen cases of both so that's kind of in general terms so chondroblastoma patient presents with local pain swelling and turniness then obviously joint manifestation uh, it happens in the epiphysis or apophysis it had the, the thin sclerotic cream and extends into the metaphysis 50 percent of the time and always remember that, remember that may or may not have inter internal chondroid matrix. So review the differential diagnosis for epiphyseal lesions, chondroblastoma, giant cell tumor, clear cell chondrosarcoma, and the other lesions that could happen anywhere in the body, including the epiphysis, which include lymphoma, metastasis, Brody sepsis, and so forth. So we have AP views of the chest and the left knee and in this patient we see multiple lesions arising from the distal femur proximal tibia proximal fibula and bilateral proximal humerus these are most multiple osteochondromas osteochondromas are a fairly common lesion of the bone they are usually solitary and the imaging hallmark of osteochondromas are exophytic lesions which usually arrive from the metaphysis and there is continuation of the medullary cavity into the lesion. So the medullary cavity extends into the lesion and there is continuation of the cortex. Uh, so these lesions, they usually say arise from the metaphysis and extend away from the articulation. That is the classic finding, not what you'll see always. They can be pedunculated or they can be sessile. Uh, importance of the osteochondromas is that they do have a cartilaginous cap. There are chondroid lesions and um, they can cause all sorts of problems uh, from transformation into malignancy, uh, which for a solitary osteochondroma will be around 1 to 2 percent and obviously mass effect upon an adjacent structures, including mechanical problem, adventitial bursa, inflammation and so forth. In this case, there are multiple of them. So there's a syndrome called multiple hereditary exostosis or osteochondromatosis. So in this case, it's an autosomal dominal uh, syndrome and the patient develops a lot of osteochondromas throughout the body. And sometimes they have to be resected due to mechanical problems just because in multiple hereditary osteochondromatosis, the uh, risk of malignant transformation goes up to 25%. So somewhere between 5 to 25% is a wide range uh, described in the literature, but they do have a higher risk of malignant transformation into chondrosarcoma than a solitary osteochondroma. Uh, also remember that uh, when this osteochondromas happen within the articulation, it is called Trevor's disease, um, which is a, a similar but different condition. So uh, we follow up these patients to make sure that these osteochondromas don't keep growing. Once you're an adult and the growth plate closes, the osteochondroma should not grow. And if they grow or change, you have to be suspicious for malignant degeneration. This may prove to be a challenge in terms of pain because, you know, um, a sudden development of pain, of pain of a known osteochondroma could be a sign of transformation but they it can also be pain due to mass effect upon a muscle or any structure around the osteochondroma remember trevor's disease dysplasia epiphyselia hemimelica which is osteochondromas of the epiphysis also remember is autosomal dominant uh, that it has an increased uh, risk of malignant degeneration as compared to solitary lesion 
And in MRI, sometimes we do uh, evaluation of the osteochondroma. And uh, something they may ask you on the test is the cartilaginous cap, so the osteochondroma. And this cap should measure less than 1.5 centimeter. The literature says that thickening of the cartilaginous cap more than 1.5 centimeters uh, may be associated to degeneration. So we have AP and lateral views of the thoracic spine. This is a case of visual recognition of a finding and a differential diagnosis. And what we see here is that there is calcification of the central aspect of the intervertebral disc. We see it both on the AP and lateral views. So the differential diagnosis for an intervertebral disc calcification is really, really long and includes many things like uh, that we could be degenerative related to CPPD, hemochromatosis, amyloidosis, uh, acromegaly, hyperparathyroidism. There's just many things that can cause this. But most of the calcifications that we see in the disc are usually of the annulus fibrosis, so peripherally. And we usually see calcification that is more to the periphery uh, of the disc, uh, but in this case it's central, which uh, I've seen in a test before. This is related to ochronosis, and in ochronosis uh, we see very dense calcification in the central aspect of the disc. Uh, we don't see this too often, but sometimes it uh, comes up in tests. So if you see an intervertebral disc calcification, just think about the whole differential diagnosis. But if you can pinpoint this calcification to be in the center, uh, you know, in the central disc or the nucleus pulposus of the intervertebral disc, just think of ochronosis in your differential diagnosis. Uh, but it's really a long list of um, differential diagnosis for intervertebral disc calcification. Just always remember, ochronosis, the calcification, is central in the nucleus pulposus. So we have AP and lateral views of the cervical spine on a patient that presents with stiffness and we see vertebral body and posterior elements fusions of multiple levels we can see it all the way here uh, definitely more than three to four levels and then on the ap view we see some spinal posterior spinal defects or non-fusion posteriorly as you would see in spinal dystrophism and also you see this little bone here that is going from the lateral aspect of the cervical spine to the superomedial aspect of the scapula. This is called the omovertebral bone. And also we can see on the AP view that there is a small cervical rib. So we have several abnormalities in the cervical spine radiograph. We have fusion of multiple levels of the cervical spine, the vertebral bodies, and also the posterior elements. We have posterior spinal defects. We have an omovertebral bone with a winged scapula on the left side. And we have a small cervical rib. This patient has clepal fail syndrome, which is a syndrome that results in faulty segmentation of the vertebral bodies. Uh, so it, it usually results in fusion. So when you see more than two to three levels of fusion in the uh, usually cervical or upper thoracic spine, think of clipal fail. The important thing also about clipal fail is that it's associated to many other syndromes and findings that we can see in imaging. <clears throat> we also know that it sprangles deformity with elevation or eleva elevated or winged scapula with the omovertebral bone, which is this bone that we see here. Uh, the hemivertebra we can see. We can also see small cervical ribs. We can see all the failures of segmentations of the vertebra, including hemivertebra, which is fairly common in clipal fail. There are three types in clipal fail, and mostly depends on where do you see it. In the cervical and upper thoracic spine will be type one. Type two will be cervical and thoracic fusion, but associated to other things like hemivertebra, omovertebral bone, and, and other ab abnormalities. And type three is either type 1 or type 2 findings with associated fusion in the lower thoracic spine and lumbosacral spine. So, so always remember that Klippefeld syndrome is associated to many other syndromes and keep that in mind. Sprengel's deformity, uh, omovertebral bone, hemivertebra, uh, 
Occipito, Atlas Fusion, all those things are very, very characteristic of Klippel Fail Syndrome. So this is one of the cases that if you see on the boards, you either know what it is or you don't. They usually call this the on mini cases. And usually once you know what it is, uh, it's just to remember a few things. In this case, some of the most common associations. So we have AP and lateral views of the chest. And this is another of the aunt mini cases. You either seen it before or you haven't. Uh, there's not much thought process here. And in this case, what we see is that this patient has absent clavicles bilaterally. Usually when I present this case to uh, lower level residents, they quite, a, they quite don't get the finding and spend a lot of time trying to look at the bones, the ribs, the proximal humerus. And the reason is because this finding is bilateral in this patient. And because the body is symmetric, we cannot spot the difference so easily. If the patient had absence of only one of the clavicles, then it will probably be easier to see. So this is a case of platocranial dysplasia or dysostosis. So whenever you have absence of the clavicles, always think of cladocranial dysplasia. So this is a problem of um, failure of intramembranous ossification of the axial skeleton. And the most common finding as we see here is the absence of the clavicle. However, we can see other findings uh, in imaging and depending on what part of the body is been imaged. So if it's a chest, the clavicle, if it's a skull, uh, you look for delay closure of the sutures and warmian bones. Uh, if it's the pelvis, uh, you look for failure of the uh, symphysis pubis uh, region to ossify. And if it's the hands, you usually will find short uh, middle phalanges. So those are the main things that you will see in later cranial dysostosis. But for sure, the hallmark finding is absence of the clavicles. So remember that cladocranial dysostosis or dysplasia is an autosomal dominant skeletal dysplasia and is due to absent membrane ossification of the axial skeleton. Always remember absent color bones, cladocranial dysostosis. And remember the other associated findings in case they ask you, including supranumerary ribs, wormian bones, delayed symphysis pubis, and abnormal and extra teeth. So we have a chest CT scan of the chest at the level of the heart with intravenous contrast, and we see this soft tissue ill-defined mass, which is deep to the inferior aspect of the scapula. This is the scapula here, and is deep to the serratus anterior muscle and also the latissimus dorsi, and it abuts the chest wall. So it lives right there in that triangle. This is very characteristic characteristic of an elastofibroma dorsi. Uh, this is a fibrotic lesion usually due to friction. It has some fat inside the lesion. So in MRI, you may see some uh, internal regions of increased T1 signal intensity that will suppress and fat suppressed images. It is bilateral in 30% of the cases and is usually seen in older female patients. Uh, in terms of imaging findings alone, this cannot be differentiated from a sarcomatous lesion, but because of the characteristic location, usually imaging findings are enough to make the diagnosis. Some patients will go to biopsy just to try to exclude a sarcoma, uh, but this lesion uh, is benign and can be treated conservatively without surgery. You can resect it surgically and it usually a safe surgery, but this is one of the lesions that in terms of imaging characteristics, we cannot say if it's benign or malignant, but because of the location, we can suggest uh, a precise diagnosis. So remember this elastofibroma dorsi uh, and the location, which is very, very, very classic. So again, a benign, slow growing connective tissue tumor that occurs most common in the elder usually bone is abnormal elastic fibers and it usually have some internal fat uh, again benign lesion uh, with a characteristic location deep to the inferior aspect of the scapula 
So we have AP and lateral views of the chest in a patient that appears to have diffuse osteosclerosis or increased density throughout the bones. And on the lateral view, we see this characteristic vertebral body pattern of increased sclerosis at the end plates with lucency in the middle. This is known as Rugger jersey vertebra and is highly characteristic of hyperparathyroidism. Interestingly enough, in hyperparathyroidism, which is a metabolic disease that affects the bone, we have decreased bone mass uh, because of the hormonal uh, imbalance in the body. And the osteoblasts accumulate osteoid at the end plates, but without hydroxyapatite. So these bones are actually weaker. And it looks dense because of the uh, very dense osteoid deposition from the osteoblast, but uh, no significant calcification there. Uh, and later on, we'll talk about metabolic bone disease. So similar findings could be seen in osteopetrosis, which what we see is a sandwich vertebra. It's, it's a very, very kind of similar finding, and some people use it interchangeably. But for a test, remember, the Brugger jersey vertebra is characteristic of hyperparathyroidism, and, and sandwich vertebra is characteristic of osteopetrosis. We've discussed in a prior review pages, and that is the picture frame vertebra. The bones are slightly enlarged, so that picture frame vertebra uh, will be usually slightly larger than the adjacent vertebral bodies. Just as a matter of a quick review, the MSK findings that we see in hyperparathyroidism will be superior to resorption, which we usually see on the radial side of the phalanges of the hand, terminal tuft erosions, distal clavicle resorption, the salt and pepper skull, brown tumors, which is usually at the end of the bones, and chondrocalcinosis. So we have an AP view of the nubosacral spine in a young 16-year-old patient with back pain. What we see here is scoliosis of the spine. Scoliosis is a fairly common finding and usually uh, it can be corrected surgically. It happens to be that in this case, this patient had recently acquired the scoliosis due to severe back pain. Uh, if we kind of look more closely to this examination, we see that this pedicle right here appears slightly more sclerotic than the other pedicles throughout the film. It may be projectional, but it may be real. And whenever you see scoliosis in a young patient, especially if it's recently acquired, uh, you have to exclude uh, osteoosteoma of the posterior spine because it creates so much pain that patients develop this type of scoliosis. We did an MRI on this patient and we see that here the pedicle on the T1 weighted images, this pedicle has diffusely decreased signal intensity, which is most consistent with increased sclerosis. On the T2 weighted images with fat suppression, we still see this pedicle and there is diffuse edema uh, throughout the pedicle. So there is something there that is creating diffuse sclerosis. With the MRI only, we can think obviously of an osteoidosis tumor which produces bone and inflammation, but also it can be a healing fracture uh, that, can, that is creating all this diffuse sclerosis. Luckily, we had a CT in this patient and the CT is clear uh, that we have between the pedicle and the lamina, we have a lucent, well-defined rounded lesion. This is what is called the nidus of an osteoidosis tumor. So this is a fairly classic presentation of osteoosteoma in the spine. 75% of the cases present with scoliosis. Although osteoosteoma is much more common on the long bones, especially in the femur, 10% uh, of the cases that we see are in the spine. And of, that, on those, of those 10%, 75% present with scoliosis. So we have to keep an eye on that. So osteoosteoma is a presents as a lucent lesion, which is tinnitus with increased diffuse surrounding sclerosis. The nidus releases prostaglandins, and that's what causes pain, usually at night, which is uh, find some relief with uh, NSAIDs or aspirin. That will be the classic uh, clinical presentation. Uh, the treatment for this can be with radiofrequency ablation, which we do image guided. We also can do cryoablation. Uh, some people are doing cryoablation now of this uh, small lesions. And, but also it can be, uh, treatment can be with M block resection. Uh, in our institution, if there's a safe way to get to the nidus and the radius of the radiofrequency probe uh, is deemed to be safe, we do it image guided because it's less invasive. So 
Osteosteoma again, a bone forming tumor. That nodus is usually less than two centimeters. If it's more than two centimeters, usually it's an osteoblastoma. Osteoblastoma and osteosteoma pretty much differ in the terms of size. So smaller than two centimeters, 1.5 to two centimeters, is an osteosteoma and larger will be an osteoblastoma. So remember, uh, the, a benign producing tumor, uh, it usually happen in long bones. Uh, Remember the size, two centimeters, more than two centimeters, osteoblastoma, less than two centimeters, uh, osteoosteoma. That fibrovascular ring enhances an MRI and the diffuse ring of reactive sclerosis because of the bone production. So we have AP frogs view or lateral views of the hip. And we see uh, that on the femoral head on the right side, there is increased sclerosis throughout the femoral head here, um, all over here. And there is also some increased sclerosis with regions of lucency on the left femoral head as well. Anytime we see an abnormality of the femoral head, especially the surface or the uh, subchondral bone, we have to think of a vascular necrosis, especially at the hip. Here we see that there is early subchondral collapse and there is the very thin line of lucency that's called the crescent sign. And that's one of the signs that we see in more advanced uh, avascular necrosis. So avascular necrosis, there's several stagings that are used. The most commonly used is the FECAT staging that goes from C to 4 and is based on the radiograph and MRI findings. As you can imagine, early in the disease, uh, the first stages of the FECAT classification, you don't see anything on radiographs. So you may see a little bit of osteopenia localized to the femoral head, but nothing more. But on the MRI, you can see early edema. On the early stages, it's important to differentiate uh, transient osteoporosis of the hip from a vascular necrosis, which could be hard as the treatment varies. Uh, but what you want to do here is try to prevent the advancement of the disease. Um, so you, you know, as, as you progress the disease, you have that subchondral collapse and you affect the mechanics of the articulation and you have advanced secondary osteoarthritis. Uh, the treatment for this in the early stages um, can be surgical with decompression. In fact, in this patient, they try that. All this line here is a core of decompression that they uh, try to do. They take a piece of the bone because they try to decrease the pressure that is a mountain within the bone that is what's causing that uh, ischemia at the subchondral bone. So in the MRI, uh, there's different findings we can see on the right side here. Uh, it's more advanced than on the left. Uh, we can see the serpiginous line uh, on the T1 weighted images around here. And uh, we can also see double line, which is because there's an interface between dead bone, uh, fibrovascular tissue, which is granulation tissue, reactive, and then normal bone, and that's the, the double line sign. We saw the crescent sign on the radiograph. There's the rim sign also, uh, which is when you have an unstable fragment. So if there is fluid surrounding uh, the avascular necrosis, then it's is deemed to be a, a unstable. There'll be a, a free fragment and that can result in a, in a loose body. Of course, once you have subchondral collapse, really you just, there's not much you can do but uh, replacement of a hip when, or the articulation that has the avascular necrosis when it's really, really, really degenerated. Uh, so remember, the st feet cut stages uh, are important from zero to four. Uh, Zero, one, and two are usually kind of normal on radiograph. The stage two can have a little bit of osteopenia on the radiograph, but not always seen. And stage uh, and stage three and four you can see on radiograph. Stage three is early subchondral so collapse, and stage four is uh, associated secondary degenerative changes with flattening of the of the femoral head. Uh, in MRI, you see it from stage one to four. It goes from edema to the findings that we see in radiographs, just translate to MRI. This is a case of advanced uh, bilateral uh, vascular necrosis of bilateral femoral heads with flattening and secondary degenerative changes. This is a case of leg calve per test, which is uh, a vascular necrosis of the hips in a pediatric population. Uh, there are a lot of eponyms for a vascular necrosis or osteochondrosis around the body. 
and some of them are due to ischemia, some of them are due to microtrauma like Keenbox, Collars, Baller, Schumermans. There are many of those eponyms that you probably have heard in the literature. So a vascular necrosis, uh, keep in mind that the best thing we can do is try to diagnose it early in the stage where we can do something about it before it gets to subchondral collapse and from that on, it just results in more advanced secondary osteoarthritis. We have lateral and sunrise patellar views of the knee and this patient with a palpable mass. And we see that there is a prepatellar soft tissue density lesion, which is anterior to the patella and the proximal aspect of the patellar tendon or ligament. And we can also see it here, this soft tissue prominence. Uh, in the sunrise view. Uh, with the radiograph, what we can tell that although it has some type of increased density, there is no calcification within the mass. By location only, we can probably suggest that there's a prepatellar bursitis, but there is no way for us with a plain radiograph to be able to certainly say that there is no mass there, that there is no soft tissue enhancing mass such as sarcoma. So we always have to do further imaging. Maybe this can be solved with an ultrasound and just assess for a cystic nature, but at least some type of further imaging should be performed. So in this case, we did an MRI and we have T2 with fat suppression, and then we have T1 weighted images. And we see again that lesion within the prepatellar soft tissues. It has very high T2 signal intensity and it has high T1 signal uh, intensity as well. Uh, so this is a prepatellar bursitis, it's a hemorrhagic bursitis. Uh, so it's inflammation obviously of the prepatellar bursa due to excessive friction. This is also known as the housemaid's knee. Uh, it used to be known in the past. So there's a lot of bursa in the body and they are usually there to decrease friction between two structures uh, that, you know, that move against each other. Uh, they have a little bit of synovial fluid uh, the synovia bursa, so they can be affected in inflammatory arthropathies and autoimmune disease, and also with excessive friction. Um, so there are two types of bursa, the synovial and the adventitial bursa. The synovial bursa are those bursas that we have to decrease friction, and the adventitial bursa are those bursas that are created due to excessive friction. So synovial bursitis occurs in permanent bursa that have a synovial lining and mesothelium. This is common in the olecranon bursa, the prepatellar bursa, the subdeltoid bursa. Those are bursa that we have and are there to decrease friction between two opposing structures. And then the adventitial bursitis, which are those bursa that are created due to excessive friction and this bursa are not permanent in the body and they are usually very common in metatarsalgia. So just remember that, I guess, first in radiographs of tissue masses, what we can only assess is if they have internal calcification or if they are causing any destruction of the adjacent bone. Uh, other than that, we usually have to do further imaging to make sure that it's not a soft tissue mass, like in this case, it was just the bursitis. Uh, with fluid and that will, that's what was causing the mass effect on the radiograph, but we cannot be 100% certain. And the other one is that there are two types of bursa, the synovial and adventitial. Synovial are permanent bursa and adventitial bursa are not permanent and are created due to abnormal mechanical friction. So we have AP views of the left shoulder in internal and external rotation and we see a lesion within the proximal humeral metaphysis that has chondroid matrix or arcs and rings. Uh, this is uh, most consistent with an enchondroma which is commonly seen in the proximal humerus. Uh, historically, differential diagnosis for a calcified lesion of the proximal humerus would include enchondroma versus a bone infarct. They can look similar. In this case, there's uh, pretty clear chondroid matrix, so this is an enchondroma, uh, all this lesion here. This patient also has some hydroxyapatite deposition and the insertion of the infraspinatus, which may correlate with calcific tendinopathy, as you guys know. So 
what do you need to know about enchondromas? So enchondromas are benign lesions. They're well defined. Uh, they're in the medullary cavity, usually eccentric. They usually cause endosteal scalloping. The problem with enchondromas is that it is impossible to differentiate a low-grade chondrosarcoma or an atypical chondroid lesion uh, from an enchondroma uh, with imaging findings alone. So obviously we use size and lesion more than five centimeters is kind of worrisome for uh, malignant degeneration just by size. Uh, less than one centimeter, uh, we comfortably call it chondroid rests and do nothing about it uh, because they're so small and they don't have any imaging characteristics that would suggest malignancy. Obviously, uh, cortical breakthrough, bone destruction, new onset of pain clinically, all those features are suggestive of transformation into malignancy. So you have to keep an eye on all of that. The problem is those lesions that are two to five centimeters, that's kind of a gray zone. And some uh, some people advocate for follow-up if there are if there are no imaging findings that would suggest malignancy. Uh, some people will suggest biopsy, uh, but for the most part, uh, if you don't see any malignant characteristics and it's in that gray zone from two to five centimeters, usually you can recommend follow-up. Uh, some experts say also that the endosteal scalloping, which is when it extends into the inner aspect, the endosteum inner aspect of the cortex and it kind of um, creates scalloping. If it's more than two thirds of the cortex, it's also one of the uh, criteria for higher risk of malignancy. So benign lesion, rings on arcs, which is chondroid matrix, characteristic of chondroid lesion, the endosteal scalloping, narrow zone of transition, and those are the things that are characteristic of enchondroma. Unfortunately, you cannot differentiate larger enchondromas from an atypical chondroid lesion just by imaging findings alone. So here we have a case of a 90-year-old patient uh, that came to the ER with a trauma. And the on the initial cervical radiographs, we see that there is increased predental space. So this is the a shadow of C2, and let's say this is the anterior arch of C1, and posterior aspect of C1, and there is increase here on the predental space. So as you guys know, in the adult, the adult, more than three millimeters is considered abnormal. Anything from five to eight millimeters of predental space is considered unstable, and it's good to remember that anything more than eight millimeters is considered a surgical candidate. There are several reasons to have increased predental space, but the most common etiology is to have RA. So we're going to explain a little bit of that. This is a case of C1 hyphen C2 rheumatoid arthritis. Also, it's good to remember that in the pediatric population, uh, anything up to five millimeter is normal. In the adult is three, more than three, and in a pe pediatric population is more than five. So we ended up doing an MRI on this patient and we have here uh, sagittal T2 and T1 images. And what we see here is this is the shadow of C2. This thing here in the back is uh, of the dense is an erosion. And we have uh, the anterior arch of C1 there and on the T2. And we see that there is a lot of synovitis around the dense with a small joint diffusion, which is that small region here that is completely high on T2. That's a small effusion. The rest is synovitis. As I was mentioning, it's better seen in the T1. The posterior aspect of the dense has a chronic erosion with a well-defined sclerotic border there. So this is chronic rheumatoid arthritis with synovitis. So keep in mind that there is no intervertebral disc at C1 hyphen C2. Uh, C1 is a ring that, as you guys know, accommodates around the dense and it's held in place by very strong ligaments. Also, because we do rotation at C1 hyphen C2, there are several bursa that decrease friction around the dense, and when you, and this bursa are synovial. And when you get active inflammation of RA, this bursa can get inflamed with synovitis, and that synovitis increased vascularity, causes erosion of the surrounding bones that we described before, and also can lead to tearing of the ligaments that hold this structure together. And that's why we get instability there. So 
Uh, this can cause instability of the atlantoaxial uh, um, articulation uh, as well as the occipitoaxial articulation and can cause basilar invagination. And sometimes in test they ask because they're at a higher risk of uh, hyperextension and impingement of the cord, uh, especially when patient is going to be intubated. So uh, it's always good to keep an eye of, at the predental space. In trauma or not, of course, in trauma, it can be from fracture and ligamentous tearing. Uh, but in RA or an inflammatory arthropathy uh, can be due to the synovitis of the bursa around the dense that cause ligamentous tearing and increase in the predental space. So a good case of C1-C2 RA. Uh, remember, that can result in basinal invagination, instability, and should be checked prior to intubation because of the hyperextension when you're trying to intubate a patient. So we have a patient here with chronic knee pain, 40 years old, came, comes to clinic with chronic knee pain. On, on the radiographs, we see a well-defined lucent lesion within the distal femur uh, at the medial metaphysis extending into the medial femoral condyle. So extending from the metaphysis to the epiphysis. Uh, characteristics of this loosened lesion are well-defined borders. We can trace a pencil around the border, but the borders are not well calcified. So these are well-defined non-sclerotic borders. There is a little bit of expansion. Uh, the lesion, as you can see, is eccentric or peripheral in the bone, and it abuts the epiphysy. That is a buzzword. This is a case of a giant cell tumor of the bone. It's also known as osteoclastoma because histologically it has a lot of multinucleated giant cells. So giant cell tumor osteo osteoclastoma. They usually coexist with aneurysmal bone cyst. It is considered to be a benign lesion, but 5% of the giant cell tumors of the bone are considered, quote, malignant because they can metastasize. So remember, 40, around 40 years old patients, usually the growth plate is closed. I've seen some giant cell tumors with an open growth plate. Uh, it's a lesion that originates in the metaphysis but extends into the epiphysis. It has well-defined sclerotic borders, but the borders are not calcified or sclerotic, which is an intermediate. In terms of aggressiveness, it's intermediate as we described before in other cases. Um, giant cell tumor is always included in the differential diagnosis of epiphyseal lesions with chondroblastoma. We, we saw a case uh, earlier in this review. Uh, also, uh, uh, we can see with Brody sepsis, lymphoma, leukemia, clear cell chondrosarcoma, uh, EG, all those things can give you epiphyseal lesions, but uh, the most common in terms of primary lesions will be uh, giant cell tumor, chondroblastoma, and clear cell chondrosarcoma. So remember about giant cell tumor of the bone. Uh, the treatment for this lesion is excision and curettage, and then usually put cement packing. Uh, keep a, you, we have to follow it up and keep an eye on the interface between the cement and the bone because the recurrence is high, so it can have up to 20% of recurrence. So there's a giant cell tumor uh, of the bone. In this case, we have a younger patient around 30 years old that has chronic knee pain. He has been to the clinic several times. They have had several radiographs which have come back with a negative report. Uh, the primary physician decided to do a CT scan as the next step. So he obtained a CT scan and we didn't see much in retrospect because I know the diagnosis. In retrospect, everything is easy. Perhaps there's a little bit of more sclerosis, uh, this region here of the distal femur. Uh, but as you can see, there is no trabecular destruction. There is no periosteal reaction. There is no endosteal scalloping or any other finding that would suggest that there is a lesion on the bone. Uh, maybe there is a very small effusion uh, on the knee joint, but nothing else. The patient continued with pain and we so on the MRI of this patient, there is an obvious lesion on the distal lateral femur. Uh, we have T1, T2, and postcanalinin images, and this lesion is 
low on T1, high on T2, and shows diffuse enhancement. Very characteristic of this lesion is that there is no significant perilation on edema. It crosses the growth plate, so part of the lesion is in the metaphysis and part of the lesion is in the epiphysis, and also there is no trabecular destruction. So this is primary lymphoma of the bone, and this presentation, although not the most common for primary lymphoma of the bone, is very characteristic for the disease. So when we see this presentation, we can be pretty, pretty certain this is primary lymphoma of the bone. Keep in mind that the most, the most common lymphoma we see in the bone is secondary, and primary is less common, and of the primary lymphoma of the bone, this is definitely not the most uh, common presentation, the most common presentation will be an osteolated destructive lesion. Uh, so characteristic of this lesion, well defined, you usually don't see on CT and radiograph because it doesn't dest destroy the trabecula. Uh, it is easily seen on MRI, it shows diffuse enhancement, usually crosses the uh, growth plate and is in the metaphysis and epiphysis and it doesn't have any perilational edema or enhancement. So remember this case because you see one, you see them all, primary lymphoma of the bone. Uh, don't miss this lesion, it's a classic appearance, even if it's not the most common appearance. Once you see it, you should not miss this uh, diagnosis. And always remember that lymphoma can look like anything in the times of the oral board. Uh, they used to tell us, hey, if you don't know what it is, just say lymphoma or tuberculosis because it can look like anything. So we have a young woman who presented with a complaint of a slowly growing mass in the plantar soft tissues. So we got some radiograph and we see some prominence of the soft tissues here uh, of the foot at the plantar region. And when there is a palpable mass and they do radiographs, usually people say, well, what a waste of time. But we always have to keep an eye for first, if there is some deformity of the surrounding soft tissues, uh, also, if there's some calcification or foreign body that we can see on the radiograph. And third, we're looking for the bones associated to the mass effect to make sure that there is no periosteal reaction or uh, cortical erosion that would suggest or help us uh, try to determine if this is an aggressive or vascular mass. So in this case, we don't see anything on the surrounding bone, but we do see some very small calcifications here. And those are in the shape of a flevolith. Those are flevolith type of calcification. So with the radiograph, we can suggest there is some type of vascular malformation or hemangioma just because of the flevolith calcifications that we see. So obviously in this patient, we did an MRI. We have T1, T2 fat sat images and post catalinian images. And we see this large lesion in the plantar soft tissues of the foot. It is invading all the intrinsic muscles of the foot. So this is a classic plantar hemangioma. Uh, plantar hemangiomas are a benign vascular lesion, although they usually behave aggressively because they invade all the soft tissue structures around the lesion. And they're really hard to treat because surgi surgically they're hard to take out because it's hard to separate them from uh, the tissue that they are invading. Very characteristic of hemangioma is that they have intralesional fat, as we see here, it's part of that uh, the lesion. They have that feathery appearance with um, uh, with that intralesional fat that will suppress on the fat suppress images. On the T2, we'll, we will see these high regions of high signal intensity, which are uh, vascular lakes, uh, dilated and uh, vessels that are malformed, and usually it shows delay enhancement. And um, all these findings are characteristic of hemangioma. In this case, there is no associated bone abnormality, although hemangiomas can cause chronic cortical erosions due to the slow flow and uh, and pulse of the lesion can cause chronic uh, pressure erosion much like um, gout will do at the, at the um, cortical region of the bone. So characteristic of plantar hemangioma, uh, look for those flevolates on the, on the radiographs and also look for that intralational fat and feathery appearance of the lesion. They can happen in any of the soft tissues, including the articulation, like a, a synovial hemangioma. 
So now we have here a case of a female middle-aged woman with breast cancer that comes to the uh, hematology oncology clinic with hip pain. So they obtain a radiograph and the initial radiograph is shown here and it's kind of a soft finding. Uh, you have to kind of pay attention but that's the reason I'm putting this case. So thankfully the body is symmetric and in the pelvis is really helpful. And if you can see this region here, the inferior aspect of the femoral neck on the left side is a little ragged or indistinct, the subchondral bone, as compared to the right side, which you can see, you can see the subchondral bone and cortex really easy. And also pay attention to the lesser trochanter. It looks a little bit uh, more loosened on the left side than on, than on the right side. So any patient with cancer that comes with hip pain, you always have to look at the lesser trochanter because the lesser trochanter for some reason is a really hot spot to get a metastatic lesion. So in general terms for the test, uh, if the lesser trochanter is avulsed or fracture in the pediatric population, you have to think of an avulsion as a young patient that plays sports and have an iliopsoas avulsion injury. But in the adult, you have to think that it's a pathologic fracture due to metastasis. So in this patient, we did an MRI and we have uh, T1, T2, which is the common protocol, and T1 fat sat post GAD uh, of this patient. And it's obvious that in all the sequences, we can see this lesion that is replacing the lesser trochanter with surrounding bone marrow edema. And on the post cannulinian images, we can see that there is diffuse enhancement to the lesion. If you compare the enhancement here as compared to here, it is pretty marked. And T1 without contrast here and T1 post contrast here, although it and, and with fast suppression, we can see that there is diffuse enhancement. So this is one of the cases that I put always because it is common to miss this type of metastasis. If if you don't pay attention to it, sometimes we get hip pain, we get a radiograph and we're looking for a vascular necrosis or a femoral neck fracture. But we have to look at those trochanters, especially in an adult and even more if the patient has a history of cancer. So this is a case of lesser trochanter metastasis. Just don't forget that it's a good place to have a MET and don't forget to look at the lesser trochanter. So here we have uh, views of the hand, PA and lateral of a patient with a known syndrome and follow up. And we have obvious findings on this red graph. We have multiple osseous lesions throughout the bones of the hands, the phalanges, the metacarpal bones. And this patient that already had resected the fifth uh, uh, finger, the little finger, and also the ulna was also resected. And we also can see that this patient Besides all those bone lesions, we have a bunch of other soft tissue lesions that have internal calcification. So this is a patient with Mafuchi syndrome, and all those lesions that we see in the bones are enchondroma, so multiple enchondroma, similar to Olier's disease, which is multiple enchondromatosis. Remember, enchondromas are really common in the hand, in the phalanges and metacarpal bones. There are uh, medullary lesions that cause expansion and classic endosteal scalloping and have chondroid, can have chondroid uh, calcification uh, inside the lesion. And when you have multiple enchondromatosis throughout the body uh, with soft tissue hemangiomas, we call that Mafushi syndrome. And in this syndrome, we have a higher incidence of uh, degeneration into chondrosarcoma up to 25%. 25% uh, of the enchondromas in Mafushi will have malignant transformation by the age of 40. And as you could see in this case, uh, there was already malignant transformation. That's why the patient had some prior bone resection of the little finger and the distal ulna. Mafushi has a predilection for one side of the body. So remember multiple enchondromatosis or multiple enchondromas in the body. Without soft tissue hemangioma, it's known as Olier's disease, but once you see those soft tissue hemangioma, it's referred as Mafuchi syndrome. And always remember they have a higher incidence to conversion or degeneration into chondrosarcoma. So the last case of this series, patient with chronic left hip pain, comes to the ER, we do a radiograph, 
And we see all this uh, region of lucency on the left acetabulum that extends into the left superior pubic There is also enlargement of the bone here. So there is an intermediary lesion. And here I have uh, I've already drawn the extension of this lesion of the bone. And at least in this radiograph, there may be a little bit of some calcification here, but we don't see much. So we definitely recommend that a cross-sectional imaging. And we did a CT and we see a large lesion which is arising from the left hemipelvis. And as you can see, it's extending into the peritoneal cavity. On the blue here, we see that it's causing mass effect upon the urinary bladder. And on the purple is the sigmoid column, so it's causing mass effect of the sigmoid column. Pay attention to this uh, uh, matrix that we see inside the lesion. This is chondroid matrix with uh, rings and arts. So such a big lesion that is breaking the cortex and have such a big soft tissue component and it has chondroid matrix, we have to think of chondrosarcoma. Uh, we, have here, we have here a coronal view of the lesion, again, extending into the pelvis with chondroid matrix. So we have talked about in chondroma uh, that it should be less than five centimeter, more than five centimeter is usually worrisome for malignant transformation. We have talked about enchondromatosis of Olier Samafuchi. They both have a higher uh, risk of the generation of the enchondromas in the body into chondrosarcoma. So chondrosarcomas are usually larger lesions uh, that have a soft tissue component. Things that you have to watch out for is new onset of pain in an enchondroma, a lesion that has gone beyond endosteal scalloping and has gone through the cortex with a soft tissue component, again, more than five centimeters. All those things go with the generation of chondrosarcoma. So as you know, chondrosarcoma can be primary and can be secondary. The secondary is the one that is associated to either the generation of an enchondroma or the generation of an osteochondroma, which we also discussed priorly, and we measure the cartilaginous cap and MRI to be less than two millimeters. Um, so uh, this is the patient that had to be surgically resected and this is the post-surgical films with partial left hemipelvectomy uh, by the surgeon actually the patient is doing well so chondrosarcoma uh, again can be primary and secondary uh, remember the different the differentiated subtype is very aggressive and if you go to a lot of tumor boards like we do here you you can see that this the differentiated subtypes can have uh, elements of osteosarcoma and fibrosarcoma uh, but the most important for you to know is that uh, enchondromas and osteochondromas can degenerate to chondrosarcoma is something that you have to keep an eye on and remember more than five centimeter new onset of pain on an enchondroma going beyond expansion of the medullary cavity and osteoscalloping with uh, cortical breakthrough and soft tissue component all those things are characteristic of the generation into chondrosarcoma so that's it for the core exam number two. So hopefully within the next month, we'll get back with the core exam review number three. Hope you have enjoyed it and hope it's helpful. Uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel so you know when uh, more of this core reviews are uploaded. Thank you.